5 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another. Come on, let's declare his mighty works together. Sing, You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. We sing great are you, Lord. Sing it's your breath. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath. We pour out a praise to you, only Jesus. Oh, yes, we do, Lord. Come on, this is what he does. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the dark. Yes, you give hope. You restore. Every heart that is broken, yes you do, we sing great, are you Lord? It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath. and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. Come on, let's give thanks to our God. Sing all the earth. We know that this is true. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Will sing. 
Well, good morning, Redemption Church. Would you stand and let's sing together this morning? Let's sing about the amazing grace that our Father has given us this morning.
Thank you so much for that worship. What a great way to start the Sunday morning services. You can just have a seat for a second. I'm Kathy Litton, and I'm here to greet you and give you some information that you may need. If you're a first-time guest with us today, we want to draw your attention to a little piece that may be in the seat back pocket in front of you. It's a little card where we ask our first-time guests to register with us and let us know a little bit about who they are. And uh, you can give us that information. You can drop it in the, um, at the welcome desk as you go out. But we would love to know a little bit more about you so we can know how to serve you better. What if I were to say these two words together? Blue, bell, and brownie. Blue, bell, and brownie. All right. Anybody? Blue, bell, and brownie. I want to announce an event this afternoon that we're going to have at 4 p.m., Many of you know that we have been in a sermon series uh, regarding our, what God has given us and our giving and our generosity. And Art Rayner is a young man that has written a book called Money in the Light of Eternity. And he's going to be here this afternoon at 4 o'clock and going to be talking about stewardship, about eliminating debt, about starting to save, and also to live and have and foster a heart of generosity. That's at four o'clock today. There is also child care available for this, but you must respond at redemption.com at before 1230 to save a spot for your child. This is for fifth grade and under. In this sermon series that we've been having on living generously, we are really looking at how that God could use our life to extend the kingdom of God. Psalm 150 reminds us that every, every breath we have, we can praise him. So as we continue to worship, all of us that have breath, we should praise the Lord here this morning. So you can stand as we continue to worship. Amen. Thank you, Kathy. Let's continue to sing about the goodness of God. Let's continue to sing about his faithfulness in our lives through everything that we've ever walked through. He's always been there. So let's proclaim that truth.
and set us free, Lord, for you rose to life. Lord, I pray that you would just continue to move in this place, Lord, and I pray that we would feel your presence, Lord, and that your spirit would be among us, Lord, and that you would just continue to move and show your, show your power in ways that we can't even understand, Lord. We love you and we thank you, and most importantly, we love you, and we thank you for your character, for who you are to us. Lord, we thank you for your son's work on the cross, and it's only through that that we have our hope. In your precious name, amen. 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 God bless you, church. Hey, let me uh, share an answer to prayer. Many of you have been praying for Abby and Seth to have a child, and they found out, or they announced this last week, that they are pregnant and expecting by April. Give the Lord praise. It's, uh, it's always been a joy to be the pastor of a fertile church. But when you pray for one set, you had no idea. You were probably actually, some of those prayers boomeranged and went over to the Taylor house. And uh, you guys announced this week that you are expecting almost at the exact same time. And so Russ and Claire, would you give the Lord, just give up a praise for the Lord. For what a blessing that is. First of all, if you're at the West Campus, let me uh, thank you for the work you do at the West Campus. You are us there. We are you here. We are one church in two locations. And we are so proud that you're joining us today for our very special guest. Our guest is Art Rayner, and he will be bringing the Word of God today. I have known Art for a long time. I serve at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary on their Board of Trustees, and Art was our Vice President and charge of institutional advancement and I'm going to tell you something that school advanced institutionally under his leadership and I'm so grateful for Art he's written a book Kathy mentioned called Christian Mon oh, he's, he's the founder of Christian Money Solutions and he authored his most recent book is Money in the Light of Eternity which is a powerful and a very important and significant work for believers he has also written the books The Money Challenge and The Marriage Challenge because money and marriage really do have a very important connection. And, and so those two are on audiobook. And if, if you're not a reader, like you just don't have time and it's never been interesting to you, get audiobooks and get into audiobooks. You can do it while you're working out, while you're driving to work. And I'm telling you, it will bless your life. You can consume knowledge in a lot of different ways, and that's a great way to do it. But I love this man. His family has uh, played a role in my life, they have been great leaders. Uh, in uh, SBC life, and we are just grateful for him. Will you give a Redemption Church welcome to Dr. Art Rayner? Yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Appreciate well, it is a true honor to be with you this morning. Uh, if you don't mind, go ahead and meet me uh, in, at Proverbs 6, 1 through 5. It's Proverbs 6, 1 through 5. I titled this sermon, Why the Urgency? Because that is the question we are going to ask of our text today. Now, I'm a dad of three boys, and, and when they were toddlers, we had outlet protectors all over the house. Can any of you parents relate? Yes, yes. Now, if you know anything about toddlers— you know that they will eat whatever you don't want them to eat. They will go after whatever you don't want them to go after. They'll stick their fingers in things that you don't want them to stick their fingers in. And so inevitably, when Sarah, my wife, and I would uh, vacuum and we'd take out an outlet protector and we'd forget to put it in, inevitably, we would see our boys' eyes immediately lock with that available outlet protector. Now, I'm not saying that when my boys were young, that if they were in the Garden of Eden, that they would have taken the, the fruit and been it. But I'm not saying that they wouldn't have, okay? We knew as soon as they locked eyes with that outlet protector, what was about to happen. And so immediately we yelled, stop! Don't go there! Run away! Change course! There's an urgency in our voice because 
we knew that the path they were heading down was going to lead to some real pain. What we see in Proverbs 6, 1 through 5 is Solomon presenting a possible scenario where the reader finds themselves in some type of debt. And Solomon says, if you find yourself in this situation, here's what you need to do, plead. Give your eyes no sleep. Twice he says, save yourself. You can hear the desperate cries of, of Solomon in this text. Any parent who has seen their child go down a path that they know will lead to trouble can, can relate to this text. Maybe their kid is, your kid is hanging out with the, the wrong crowd. Maybe they're dating somebody that's pulling them away from, from God. And so you plead with them, change course, get out of the situation, run. This is exactly how Solomon addresses those who find themselves in some type of debt. Let's read our text today. Proverbs 6, 1 through 5 says, My son, if you have put up security for a neighbor, if you have given your pledge for a stranger, if you, have, if you are snared in the words of your mouth, caught in the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, and save yourself. You have come into the hand of your neighbor. Go hasten and plead urgently with your neighbor, give your eyes no sleep and your eyelids no slumber. Save yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the hand of the fowler. A few months ago, Bill Fay from Debt.org wrote this. He said, The famed Patrick Henry proclaimed, Give me liberty or give me death at Americans' founding. As the country emerges from the COVID-19 pandemic, Americans' motto has changed to forget financial liberty, give me debt. American household... Uh, debt hit a record $16.9 trillion at the end of 2022. Americans owe $986 billion on credit cards. Let me go ahead and update th that number for you. That is now $1 trillion. Surpassing the pre-pandemic high of $927 billion, we owe $11.92 trillion on mortgages, $1.55 trillion on vehicle loans, and $1.6 trillion on student loans. With the average consumer debt in America on the rise, it's no surprise that debt delinquency missed payments of 30 days or more has increased for all, nearly all debt types. You see, in America, debt has become normalized. It's just the, the air that we, that we breathe. It's just a part of life. Yet when Solomon says, yet Solomon says, save yourself, don't sleep until you are free. I mean, those are some pretty intense words, right? I mean, how many times have you told somebody, don't sleep until you have done something? So we ask our text, why the urgency? Well, to answer this question, we need to consider some macro level teachings from scripture about money. We need to get the foundation right. Because I believe if we understand the foundation, according to the Bible, we will under, better understand the urgency we find in these verses. Now, when it comes to money, the foundation is an issue of identity. Getting money right starts with a right identity. Here's what I mean. You cannot get money right un unless you understand who God is and who you are in the relationship with money. Why? Because who you think you are often determines the decisions that you will make. Now, a parable is a, is a story with a spiritual lesson. And in Matthew 25, 14 through 30, Jesus tells the parable of the talents. The story includes one master, you may be familiar with it, and three servants. The master is about to go on a long journey, and so he hands the servants some talents or an amount of money. To one servant, he hands five talents. To the other, he hands two talents. And then the third servant, he hands one talent. Then the master goes on his journey. Eventually, the master returns, and the three servants share with him what they had done with the talents. The first servant reported that he had doubled the talents, going from five to ten. The second servant reported the same thing, that he had doubled the talents, going from two to four. The third servant gave another report, which, by the way, the first two servants, the master said, hey, well done, good and faithful servant. The third servant, the third servant presented only one talent, no more, no less. And the master then condemned the third servant because he had not done anything with the talent. The master said he at least could have put it in a bank and earned interest for that, for that talent. Now, here are a few things that we learn from Jesus' parable. First, God is the owner. The master in that story represents God. God is the owner. I truly believe that if we got just this one part right about the foundation for money— 
that it would change everything. That if we truly believed that God is the owner of everything, that it would change everything. I mean, imagine if when you, when you looked at the balance in your bank account, you weren't looking at your balance, but you were looking at God's balance. You weren't checking on your spending. You're checking on how you're managing God's funds and, and how you're spending his resources. Imagine how the, the decisions would be different. Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all of its people belong to him. You see, it's all his. I know. In this room, some of you are thinking, but yeah, Art, I hear you, but I worked for this. You see, it's in, it's in my, my bank account. I earned this money. And maybe even if we don't verbalize that, the decisions that we make often indicate that mindset. Let me encourage you to think about this. Possession does not equal ownership. Possession does not equal ownership. When I was 15, I got my first, you know, real job. Does everybody remember their first, like, real job, real paycheck? Yeah, mine was at a place in Louisville, Kentucky called The Park. And at this place, there was, it was a go-kart track and a, and a putt-putt course. My job was to care for the, for the go-karts. So I was the one that got people in and out of the, of the go-karts. Now, by the end of the summer, I knew everything there was to know about those go-karts. I knew which one was fastest. And so if I liked you, you're probably going to go in that one. I knew which one was slowest. And so if you were giving me problems in the line, I'm sending you in that one. I knew which one was likely to have some type of engine trouble by the end of the day. There's actually a couple of them. And so if it was getting toward the end of the day and you're giving me some problems, I was definitely sending you in one of those two go-karts. I knew everything that there was to know about those go-karts. But let me ask you a question. At any point... Were those go-karts my go-karts? No. You all know the answer. They were not my go-karts. They were the owner's go-karts. I was just simply there to do what the owner wanted me to do with his go-karts. I was there to carry out his mission. See, possession does not always equal ownership. God is the, is the owner. Here's the second thing we learn from this parable. We are the managers. In this parable... The servants represent you and me. God entrusts us with his resources to carry out his plan and purposes. Now, some of you have probably heard of the word stewardship. Stewardship just means taking care of something, often on behalf of someone else. Managers do this all the time. We are the stewards or the managers of God's resources. There are a few other, possession, or a few other teachings that we find in this parable. We see that we are held accountable for whatever God has entrusted to us. Throughout the Bible, we see that, that God does not always distribute his resources evenly. Some get more, some get less. But to all, stewardship is required. And just to be clear, the one who turned two into four was just as celebrated as the one who turned five into, into ten. By the way, who was the one that was condemned? It was the, the one who, was, who had one, the third servant, who returned only what he had been entrusted with. Now, what was he condemned for? He didn't waste it. He didn't, he didn't go and spend it on something that he shouldn't have spent it on. What did he do? He did nothing. Let's say I walk into my boys' rooms, one of the rooms, and I notice that their bed isn't made up. And I, I tell them, hey, son, you, you need to make up your bed. It's still a mess. And then I walk out. 30 minutes later, I return back to his room. And I notice something. The bed is still not made up. Now, over those past 30 minutes, he didn't make his bed look worse. He didn't mess up his room anymore. But when I ask him, hey, son, what have you been doing? He says, nothing. He still may receive some type of consequence. Now, I'm not saying that this has actually ever happened, but I'm not saying that it hasn't. But I can, say, I can still hear his voice saying, but dad, I didn't do anything. And my response was, exactly. You were supposed to be doing something. This leads us to one more thing that we learned from this parable. When the master returned, the two that were celebrated had accomplished something specific. They increased the master's wealth. You see, when the master returned, he owned more than when he had left. 
His kingdom had grown. It had advanced. Now, this helps us understand what God wants us to do with his money. God has entrusted us with his money for his mission. But he's not after more money. I want to be clear about that. He's after hearts. In Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Jesus provides us our mission. Jesus said, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is known as the Great Commission. A commission is an instruction or a, or a command. Being a good manager of God's possessions is not just about keeping everything safe. There is a, there's a mission. There's something far more compelling. The owner has a, has a goal. The financial resources he has entrusted to you and me are meant to be a part of something significant, changing lives for all eternity. But to be clear, God doesn't need your money to accomplish his, his plans. He can do whatever he, ever he does, desires with or without your, your generosity. Yet, yet he invites us to participate in his mission. Why? I, imagine a dad who invites his six-year-old son to help mend a, a broken fence. Does the dad really need his son's help to mend that broken fence? No, in fact, in, in, a, <laughs> some, in, in a very real way, it actually gets a lot more complicated, right? Right? The invitation makes it a lot more complicated. So why does the dad invite his son to mend that broken fence? Well, it's about, it's about deepening a relationship. It's about building trust. It's about helping the son to know and understand more about the dad. It's about helping the son to become more like the dad. It's about helping the son to be a part of something much greater than he could be a part of on his on his own the dad doesn't want something from the son he's not trying to take something from the son he's trying to give something to the son this is why when you read verses on money as you have in throughout this series it becomes clear that generosity it's our financial priority god wants something for you so back to the question why the urgency when it comes to debt well let me pl- uh, provide three uh Lessons, three reasons that are rooted in, in Scripture. Why the urgency? Number one, because debt weighs you down. Debt weighs you down. The Bible actually doesn't call debt a sin. That's, that's not in there. But it does provide some really strong teachings about debt. The Bible tells us to be cautious about going into debt. Proverbs twenty two twenty six through 27 says, Don't be one of those who enter into agreements, who put up security for loans. If you have nothing with which to pay, even your bed will be taken from under you. So to put it plainly, you need to be careful. A a slight miscalculation, an unforeseen financial event can put you in a very difficult position. Debt is not something that you just simply want to jump into carelessly. If if at all possible, you you want to avoid it. The second thing we can learn in Scripture is that if you do go into debt, the Bible tells us that you will be burdened. Now, one of the most well-known verses on debt is Proverbs 22, 7. It says, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is a slave to the lender. Now, anyone who has taken out debt can relate to this. The bill arrives, and even though you want to do something different with that debt, <laughs> or with that bill, yeah, with that money, you want to you go on a vacation, you want to buy a gift, you want to do something else with that money, you can't. Why? Because you are a slave to the lender. Debt is a, is a burden, and it, and it works like this. So I was, as, I was at a church in, in North Carolina, and I had up on the stage with me a, uh, a 15-pound dumbbell. Now, I don't, I don't have that with me today because I'm not really sure how TSA would, would handle it, and so I decided not to bring it. But I, I said, hey, I have a 15-pound dumbbell. Is there anybody in the congregation that feels like they can hold this 15-pound dumbbell over their head? Hands went up all around. So I picked out a very confident person, somebody who looked very confident in their ability to do that, and I brought them up on stage. And I said, okay, here's the dumbbell. Go ahead and do that. He did that. I said, that's very impressive. That's great. Now, here's the thing. I need you to hold that for me over your head for the next 30 minutes. The guy wasn't as confident, but he said, okay. So I went back and we're here. about to start, continue my, my teaching. And I said, hold on. Now, I'm going to hang out at the church a little bit longer, so I need you to do that for the next hour. Can you do that? And at that point, he said no. 
I can't do that. So well, why? I thought you said you could lift the, the weight over your, over your head. He said, yeah, but my arms are going to start getting tired. This weight is going to start feeling a lot heavier as time goes on. That's exactly how debt works. At first, you feel like, I got this. It's not a big deal. I can afford it. And so you take on the debt. But then time goes on and on and on. And as it goes on, that debt that you felt like you could so easily carry suddenly feels a lot heavier and heavier. And you just want to get rid of it. Debt weighs you down. Financially, debt weighs you down. Emotionally and mentally, debt weighs you down. Debt has been connected to anxiety, stress, depression. Relationally, debt weighs you down. Debt has been connected with couples spending less time together, increased fighting, and decreased marital satisfaction. You are carrying around this burden, and the longer you carry it, the heavier it seems and the greater impact it has on your life. Are you there? Some of you are. Some of you are there, statistically speaking, right, right now. Imagine what life would be like. Imagine what your generosity could be like if you did not have that debt. It's a pretty incredible thought, isn't it? So why the urgency? Debt weighs you down. Why the urgency? Debt is a matter of the heart more than a matter of the credit card. Now, for most people, debt occurs when they buy something that they can't afford. That's typically how it happens. But the outcome rarely starts with a, the tap or the swipe or the insert of a credit card. In fact, in the sequence of events that lead to debt, that's usually the last act. A, a, sign is, a symptom is a sign of something else. So if you're sneezing, it may be a symptom of you having allergies. Now, my kids are very good at the interrogative technique known as the five whys. Anybody familiar with that? If you're not, I'm going to tell you how it goes. So I give them some type of amazing statement, incredibly wise statement, and they respond with a, but why? You know, maybe I've told them to do something, say, but why? And so I provide them a very you know, logical, just incredible explanation of why they need to do this or why I made, the, why I made this statement. And I'm thinking that their response is gonna be, oh, dad, you are so wise, you are so smart. Man, I, it's just, thank you. Thank you, I'm so grateful that you're my dad. No, that's not how they respond. They respond with a, but why? Now, first time I gave a good explanation. Second time, it's a little bit more brief. A little, there's a little irritation in my, in my voice, but I give them an explanation. And then they follow up with a, but why? Now, at that point, I don't even make it through the five, let them make it through the five whys. I immediately resort to the because I told you so answer. Now, the five whys technique can be somewhat irritating, but it really helps you get down to the root of the, of the problem. Why did you buy that furniture set that you couldn't afford? Well, because I felt like I needed uh, the living room set. Well, well, why? Well, I was over at a friend's house, and I saw that they had bought a brand new living room set, and, and, and so I thought that we would need to purchase one too, but well, why? Well, you know, they seemed so happy and they were so excited about their living room set. I felt like we needed some happiness in our life and so I felt like that would, that would help us be happy as well. well but, but why? Well, I guess I'm putting my hope in, in stuff. I was meeting with a lady uh, who, I, so I do something called financial counseling. I was meeting with a, with a lady. We were working through her, her debts. It's actually her and her husband. They actually had a number of, number of debts. They had about 10 to 12 credit cards with significant balances on each one. And so as we were working through some type of debt, debt payoff plan, she looked at me and she said, I just don't understand, Art, how everybody does this. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, I just don't understand how everybody affords what they, what they have. I don't understand how they drive what they drive. I don't understand how they buy what they buy, go on the vacations that they go on. I don't understand how they have the house that they have. I just don't understand how everybody can afford this. Of course, I looked at her and said, well, what if people are looking at you wondering the exact same thing? I mean, on the outside, you have the car, you have the, the vacation, you have the house, you have all the stuff, but it's propped up by dead. It's a, it's a facade. What makes you assume that everybody else is different than, than you see? As, did this lady have a financial problem? Absolutely. She did. 
but as we started talking, and as we started going through the five whys, it became apparent that she had a, a heart problem. She was trying to keep up with the, with the Joneses, which means just trying to maintain the standard of living of those around her. She was placing her hope in, in stuff. For some, the real problem is not debt. Debt is the, the smoke alarm. It's, the, it's the, the, the warning. In fact, debt may be the wake-up call for some in this room that saves you from something far worse. Debt may be the wake-up call that that tells you that your heart is actually wandering from God, that it's putting hope in in material things instead of God. Maybe that you're acting like the owner instead of the the manager. So why the urgency? Because debt is usually not about debt. Debt is about a heart whose hope has been placed in something other than God. Why the urgency? Here's our third. Because you and your money were meant for more. Did you know that God has designed you for, for generosity? He really has. Did you know that when you give, studies consistently show that you're happier, you're more satisfied, you're more content with your with your decision, your financial decision? I mean, think about it. How many have ever met a happy, generous person? You know, raise your hand. Yeah, I certainly have. I know quite a few of them. How many have ever met a miserable, generous person? I I haven't. Now, I'm not saying that there's not one out there, but I personally haven't. See, according to the Bible, God has designed you and me for kingdom-advancing generosity. And here's the thing. Your heart already knows this. Your heart longs for something more because it was made for something more. Now, have you ever found yourself, though, in a place where you wish you could give more? Barna, um, which is a research organization, actually says many in this, there's many in the church that are in this category, that you wish you could give more but you couldn't because you had to pay your, your debts. You see, debt actually makes life a lot more expensive. It's just a math- mathematical fact. Uh, con- consider this example. You and your friend decide to each buy a living room set, and that living room set costs $5,000. Your friend is able to purchase that living room set with cash. You, on the other hand, are not able to buy it with cash, and so you take out your credit card that has a 20% interest rate, swipe the credit card, and you put it on that, that credit card. How much did your friend pay for that living room set? $5,000. How much did you pay for it? Well, let's assume that you just make the minimum payment on your credit card, which is about $125 per month. You will end up paying off that living room set in five years. Over that five-year period of time, you would have paid $2,700 in interest. That means you paid $7,700 for a $5,000 living room set. You see, debt just makes life more expensive. In the first message of the series, you, you heard about the Great Commission opportunity that we have here in the United States. In fact, we have the financial capacity to reach every tongue, tribe, and nation in our generation. There is a person on the other side of the world that has yet to hear about Jesus. What if you got out of debt so that the gospel could get to that person? What if you got out of debt so that somebody's life would be changed for all of eternity? Imagine that the Revelation 7-9 moment where, where you're surrounding, you're part of a great multitude that's surrounding the throne and you look out over the crowd and you realize that there are some in that crowd that are there because you made a decision to get out of debt and put more money toward advancing the gospel around the world. Imagine what you will be thinking in that moment. Worth it. Worth it. It's all worth it. Without question, that is what you will be thinking in that moment. So let me ask you, are you experiencing what God has designed you for? Why the urgency? Because debt weighs you down. Why the urgency? Because debt is often a matter of the heart more than a matter of the credit card. Why the urgency? Because you and your money are meant for so much more. Now, I know some of you may be thinking, so this sounds great, but I'm in debt right now. Like, I need help right now. What do you have for, for me? Well, once again, I do something called financial counseling, and if you were to meet with me, there's a few different suggestions that I would make. The, the first is this. Get a blueprint for mission. Get a blueprint for mission. Most are going to call this a budget. 
I, I, I like to call it a blueprint for mission because I, I believe that God has entrusted us with his resources for his mission. And so our budget, our blueprint for mission is our plan to help us accomplish that mission. I have found over, over actually several years now that those who feel out of control in their finances, when they get together a blueprint for mission or a budget or a spending plan, whatever you want to call it, suddenly they feel a lot more in control. Their stress goes down, their anxiety goes down. Why? Because they are more in control. They're suddenly, they suddenly have a plan. Now, I like what's called a zero-based approach, which is where when you put together your, your monthly blueprint for mission, all of your monthly income minus all of your expenses equals zero dollars. So this is what you'll do every single month. This means that every dollar has a mission. You've given it a mission. Every dollar has a purpose. It has a plan. You are tracking every single dollar. So get a blueprint for mission together. The second thing that I would encourage you to do is pay off your debt using the debt snowball method. Some of you may be familiar with this particular approach. According to research, this is actually the most effective method plan for paying off debt. Here, here's how it works. You order your debts from your lowest balance to your highest balance. Then any additional money outside of the minimum payments goes toward that lowest balance first. After you pay off that lowest balance, balance, you roll the amount, monthly amount that you were paying toward the smallest balance into the next balance, and you pay that off, and you continue doing that until you are debt-free. Let me give you an example. Let's assume that you have, you have four debts. You have a $38,000 car loan. You have a $5,000 credit card, a $4,500 credit card, and $2,000 personal loan. You're going to order those from lowest balance to highest balance. Now, uh, keeping the, the minimum payment um, as 300 on the, on the first one, and we're going to assume that you're able to put an additional $300 toward that first debt, so the total is, is $600. Once you have paid off that first debt, then you roll the amount that you were paying toward that second debt, then you knock out that one, then you roll it to the third, knock it out, roll it to the fourth, knock it out, and then you are debt free. Now, why does this method work so well? Well, it's all about motivation. Getting that, getting that first win really does something for you. It makes you realize that, hey, I can actually do this. Why? Because you can do this. In fact, when I meet with people, I regularly tell them, hey, I want you to stop thinking about this as the rest of your life. I want you to start thinking in terms of seasons. This is a season in your life if you let it be a season. You can knock out this, this debt. You can free up more resources for the advancement of God's kingdom if you view this as a, just a season. It doesn't have to be the rest of your, of your life. Here's the last thing I would tell you to, to do, and we're gonna go home on this one. Ask why until you get to the heart of the problem, which is often a heart problem. Are you looking toward money or stuff to fulfill you? Are, you? are you more concerned about how others perceive you than how God knows you? Are you viewing yourself as the owner instead of the manager? Why? 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 Now, when some of you get to the heart of the problem, you may find that that the problem is that your heart has been yearning for something that you've been constantly trying to fill with a number of different things, but none of it seems to work. You've been trying to get the bigger house. You've been trying to get the bigger paycheck. You're, you're thinking that if I can just get that nicer car, if I can just go on that better vacation, then my heart will be satisfied, but ultimately none of it satisfies your heart's longing. And it's because your heart was meant for something more. It was meant for, for God. And more than a blueprint for mission, more than a debt snowball, you need to be saved from your sins and have a relationship with God. You see, the Bible clearly teaches that the, the moment a person turns from their, their sins and trusts in Jesus to be forgiven of their sins will be saved. And so more than anything, more than anything this morning, I would plead you to, plead with you to do that. 
run from the burden of debt. Save yourself. It's weighing you down. It's an outflow, a symptom of a heart problem. You and your money were meant for so much more. Pursue that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this church. They are a, a generous church. I know them well. I'm amazed at what you continue to do in and through this congregation. Thank you so much for their faithfulness. God, you have entrusted us with your resources for your mission. God, you have, you have wired us to be a part of something so much greater than a bigger bank account, a nicer car, a better vacation. You have invited us to be a part of your mission, the Great Commission. God, help us to be wise with our resources. Not so, once again, we have a bigger bank account, but so that that man, that woman, that child in our community, that man, that woman, that child on the other side of the world will hear about you. God, help us to be wise with our resources so that we can be a part of changing lives for all eternity. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You. I want to ask you, if you're a couple here, I'm going to ask you to take hands together as we pray. If you're a young person, make a place to pray at your, at your seat there and maybe get on your knees. But as a couple and as a family and as an individual, let's start asking the Lord very simply, Lord, what are you saying to me? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Just begin praying that right now. Lord, what are you saying to me? Maybe I have been living my life and managing my resources as if they are mine. Do I surrender them? Do I dare surrender them to you? Every good gift comes from above. Maybe you think you've got the management under control, but is it exactly the way the Lord would have you to do it? Maybe you're drowning. Debt, fear, confusion, frustration, all the side effects on your marriage and family life. Would you simply be bold enough to keep asking the Lord why? Why do I have to do this? Why do I have to have that? Go further. Why? Father, you are faithful and good to your people. You love us, Lord. You have provided richly for us. Lord, I ask that your spirit would help us not just rely on an assumption that we've made that we just are not in a place to be able to give. But Lord, for the blessing and the privilege of giving through our church to the nations, being generous with even strangers, letting the wealth and the blessing flow through us that the gospel may go to the unreached people groups of the world. Ask the Lord to help us all, but you specifically as we continue to worship him. Thank you.
table if you have a cup if you do not have a cup would you raise your hand our deacons look around got a couple of hands here there's one over on this side some over there anybody else you do or do not there's one toward here in the back keep your hand up so we can see it everybody standing it makes it a little more challenging hey Rudy go straight back to the next section behind the one you're in back over there on the left side thank you brother Go ahead and prepare the bread. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, Let a person examine himself then to eat the bread and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many are weak and ill and some have died. I just made this moment very sobering not an addendum to the service. This is a moment in the presence of a holy God who is worthy of our best. If you would take that bread. Paul then writes, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That in the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke that loaf of bread and he said, this is my body which is for you. Eat this, remembering me. While you prepare the cup, what are you remembering? that he who had no sin was made to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God can you imagine that you can stand before a holy God as pure and righteous only because of the body and the blood of Jesus scripture then says the same way after supper he took the cup he said this is the new covenant in my blood do this 
as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And here's the best part. Just like our giving, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's kingdom, his death, burial, and resurrection until he comes. You give through your church. It's times you think when you look at your resources, I don't have enough to make any difference. That's why we give together. Because whatever you bring and whatever someone else brings, God knowing his body, he knows what each of us have. And together we make a difference in this world and this community for his glory. Let's continue to worship our God, continue to praise him. We are in his presence in the most unusual way when we partake of the Lord's table. So just while you're at it here, love him back, praise him back. for our rainer this morning. Thank the Lord, Art. Hey, just because we are a sent people, I'm going to ask everybody that's going on the Denver and the two New York teams to come stand here at the front. We are going to commission you today. Um, they may not all be in this service or on this campus, but we've got quite a few. Two teams to New York to work with Bobby and Holly up in Hell's Kitchen. What a great place to go. Where's your church going? We're going to the gates of hell with the gospel. And boy, he is doing an amazing work through the Shirley's. And we're going out to Boulder, Colorado. If you go on this trip, you will be near the University of Colorado Buffaloes. I'm just telling you. Okay, okay. Well, maybe your team isn't winning right now. Anyway, that's okay. But we are proud of each and every one of you. Thank you for going. And thank you, church for your giving through your church allows them to go. And we send them today with the blessing.
blessing of a sent people. You know, we close every service here by asking a couple of questions. What is God telling you? What, what have you heard today? What, how's the Holy Spirit nudged your heart toward obedience to, to your Lord and Christ? And the second question is, what are you going to do about it? There's opportunities for us in all kinds of ways to serve, to lead, to pray, to evangelize. And so we know this is a tradition of this church. You are never dismissed here, but you are a sent people. Father, I pray for this mission trip team right here, Father, that you would grace them with opportunities to plant the truth of the gospel into the souls that they encounter wherever their foot is traveling, Father. That you would represent, you would, their lives would represent Jesus Christ to people that don't even know who Jesus Christ is. And the Holy Spirit would be active and alive and there would be spiritual fruit born for your name and for your glory. Amen. You are sent people.
his gates with thanksgiving as we choose to lift a song of praise wherever we are this morning. Let's sing together. I count on one thing The same God that never fails will not fail me now Will not fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never laid is working all things out. He's working all things out. Oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy.